Yep. I'm Ashley Steinke, uh, owner operator of Sedgwood Farms in Chippewa County, Wisconsin. My wife, Stacy, and I, with our three boys, and I say with three boys, uh, tongue in cheek because they're too young to really do anything yet other than drive us crazy when they're fighting every day. Um, but I'm here today to talk about what we do on our farms from a habitat and wildlife conservation standpoint. I'm a very, I always tell people I'm a very unconventional farmer the way I came to this life of farming. Um, my background has always been wildlife conservation, graduated from UW Stevens Point with my undergraduate degree, um, went to South Dakota State, did a master's degree there, and then came home to Wisconsin and started a PhD at Madison. And me and you were at Madison at the same time, and I didn't, didn't know each other. Um, but of all those things, I studied turkeys in South Dakota, and then I studied prairie chickens in Wisconsin. And my love for hunting and my love for wildlife um, led me down this career, and then my oldest son was born. I was driving 55 minutes one way to work. I was a county conservationist in Taylor County. At the time, we decided that I would stay home because um, my wife had a job closer to home, so she would work for the benefits and all that stuff. And I'd stay home and raise the kids and then really concentrate on our farm work that we have and our conservation work that we do for, for our lifestyle. Uh, I always just start this slide it's a really great photo off our uh, back porch of our old house um, uh, over some wetlands that we had restored and a native warm season prairie that we'd restored. Going out to South Dakota and living there for three years and I became friends with a lot of local ranchers and South Dakota State's a pretty rural university yet. I told my wife if we ever start a farm I need a brand and so that's what it was, SW. Um, we don't ever put brand, brands on cattle but I thought we'd be cool if we were cattle producers and had a brand. So. Um, the next slide is just for laughter. I'm going to say that. Nobody get mad at me. I just want to say that my seed dealer is cooler than most of your seed dealers because when we were seeding down, this is a pal of the seed I got from them one day. Uh, apparently, they were really bored in the warehouse and they had an artist on staff. So that's, so that's what came out the semi when they delivered it. The Ashley Stanky Farm is phenomenal. Um, one of the reasons that we wanted to do this, and we're 100% grass-fed, grass-finished, direct market, is that sense of community that it seems like so many of us strive for. You know, the days when Friday night football was big in our small towns, and we had the little general stores, and people came into town and had coffee and went to the local cafe and hardware store on Saturday mornings. You know, some of our small towns are still like that, but most of them aren't. And I'm going to go through these real quick, but we always talk about, you guys have heard the triple bottom line, right? When you farm, it has to make economic sense. If you're not making money at it, you're not going to be there long. Uh, ecological, which is mostly what we're going to talk about here today. And then social. With you know, I was just talking to Leslie about how much time she spends direct marketing and her efforts to um, connect with the consumer versus just transactional relationships. So I just, I'm going to start out with just a few pictures of what you guys are normally used to seeing when you're at a conference like this when we talk about grazing and farming, you know, soil, soil health. This was in an outwintering area. Um, you just see how, with all the stuff going on that we got here. And then just the pictures of, of grass, right? It's what we're all striving for. And we have a registered British white cow herd. Um, doesn't look like British whites, right? It's a group of feeder cattle that we buy um, that we end up finishing. But here's some British whites, and believe it or not, these black ones are British whites. It's just a recessive gene where you get a few that are black. And again, just some some steers on grass. Now, winter in area, and as Jason mentioned, I have a very love-hate relationship with outwintering uh, due to mostly white-tailed deer because we have too many. This was my former life. I used to work at a uh, environmental charter school, so we'd have students out helping restore wetlands and just do other things on our farm. And your token clean water pick, this was a six inch rainfall in July, and this was a little uh, stream that we have running through our pastures, and you can see how clear, clear the water is, and that's a old rust belt culvert at the, at the road where it leaves our farm, and you can still see how clear it is. But we're gonna get here now to why I'm here to talk about what we do on our farm. But I'd like to start out with a question for all of you. How many of you all own a farm or work on a farm? 
How many government agency folks are in the room? <laughs> so, raise your hand again. On your farms, how many of y'all have an area on your farm that you'd call less productive? Like a low area that's wet. Almost everybody in here has one of those, right? Yep. How many of you graze that? What's in it? Reed canary grass mainly? Yep. Some sedges? How many, how many of those low areas that you guys have that you just raised your hand about, how many are ditched? I have ditches that a lot of people call them grass waterways running out of them to the nearest stream. How many have ditches in your, in your pastures? So quite a, quite a few of you are like, yeah. So, but it, se it seems like quite a few of you. So in Wisconsin, um, as of 2022, we've lost about 50% of all of our wetlands that we originally had on our landscape, which means it's not surprising to me when I asked you guys that question of how many of you have wetlands, how many of your ditch, that a lot of your hands went up, right? Because we drained wetlands in the past for agriculture, and we did it many different ways. You know, Doug Stanix in the crowd here, he's talking about his neighbor where he grew up, did it almost all with a plow. We have a project that I'll talk about on here a little bit ago, uh, or in a little bit, that they did it with horses and a plow behind horses in the early part of the 1900s. And now we use bulldozers and we use tile drainage and all, all different things to do that. But we, want, we, do, we don't have to look far to wonder why our waterways are impaired and why our landscape's impaired when we've drained off much of that. So let's just get into what we do. This is the first place that my wife and I bought in 2009 when we both finished college. And I remember walking it, trying to decide if we were going to purchase it or not when we were moving back to the Chippewa Valley. And we were walking through, and if you guys can see that pointer, I saw this ditch running through here, this waterway. And it used to run right down here to this stream. Another interesting tidbit of this farm is... You see the stream coming here and it's now going like this. Well, see this land right here and this land right here. In the 1940s, we were told historically, and there's a culvert right here that had a water control structure in it. The owner at that time had an idea that he could close this oxbow, this stream off. And in high water periods, he'd flood it through this culvert and then shut the door and raise fat head minnows for the bait industry back then and um you know it lasted for a couple three years apparently and then he went out of business on that but here we have this degraded stream now right because we've lost it it's like 1700 feet of original stream bed on the place but and right back here is a big sedge meadow um that still couldn't be farmed even with that ditch coming through here and there was a ton of water running through here so one of the first things we did is and this was all this was all grazed continuously by dairy heifers from a neighbor, and this was all grazed continuously, dairy heifers and the stream banks were eroded. But the first thing we did is we went in and we made a scrape right here to get borrow material to fill this ditch from right here down to this stream. So now we flooded all of this wetland. We have a little wetland right here. This wetland is, it was designed for the water to run through here real slow and then eventually run back out. Um, and then we actually you, we sprayed all these areas out here out of the native or non-native cool season spotted knapweed and turned it back to native prairie or native warm season planting. This is what it looked like uh, a year and a half post restoration. You, know, you start getting some uh, swamp milkweed in here and a bunch of other good, but this is the water in that scrape. This is a look down on this sedge meadow. We were starting to get reed canary grass that was coming out here, and we eliminated that just by putting more water on it and restoring the hydrology of that area. And this is a native part of the native prairie planting that we had in here. And that's another picture right there of, of late summer on that. I think this was two years post planting. <clears throat> this is in that sedge meadow. It was when we first bought the place, we could walk across it in crocs and sandals and not get your feet wet, right? And this is what it looks like now. And uh, a pair of sandhill cranes took after a muskrat hut soon after. 
And I don't know how many of you know that. It has two chicks um, in this picture. About 100% of the time, one of those dies. The one actually kills the other one. It's called civil side um, in cranes, which is a very interesting eco or evolutionary trait that they have. Um, and just another reason that we like doing this is this is that scrape we were talking about. We had a family birthday party and all the kids and family are ice skating on it. So we basically created our own fun right in our backyard on that. <clears throat> so this is our next project. In 2010, we were driving around, my friend Chad and I were driving around. It was right before the opening weekend of duck season. And we had, I don't know if how many remember 2010, but we had like biblical floods that year. We got like 12 or 13 inches of rain in the middle of September. And normally we hunt the Chippewa River for opening day, and you couldn't because it was so dangerous. The water was so high. So we were driving around, and we found this place, and it was flooded, of course. And at, in September, is a different picture. Obviously, the corn is up eight feet, but it was full of mallard ducks that were on one corner of this. And we stopped by the farmer's place, and I'd known that farmer from growing up in that area, and he said, you know, I've always let you hunt geese on my fields, but I like having the ducks around, but if you own that, you could hunt it yourself. You don't even ask anybody, and here it is, 2010, we're fresh out of college, not any money, and, and I kind of laughed, and he said, 1200 bucks an acre, and I was like, that seemed like a pretty good price, and at, that was at the high grain prices, so I drove home, and I told my wife, I said, we just bought 160 acres today. <laughs> and she's like, you did what? And I said, well, I haven't bought it yet, but I'm going to the bank on Monday because I think this pencil's out. We could rent it um, to a grain farmer who's already farming it, and it would pay the entire mortgage. And then I knew it was ditched and tiled. And I said, sooner or later, we could do something with that um, from a wetland standpoint and, and at least make our money back on it. So this was the spring. So went to the bank and the guy's like, well, this seems to make a lot of sense. We could get a five-year deal from the farmer. It paid the mortgage on it. And then we had a little extra cash to pay the property taxes on it after that. Um, so he gave us a loan and we bought it in like a month after that. And this is the following spring. And you can, you can kind of see these are ditches right here where this water is. See right here and there, there. And that was, this is 120 acres on the front. There's a 40 acre piece in the back. Um, that we actually were able to trace down the old landowner's grandkids and learned a bunch of history about it. And they talked about that um, their grandparents had ditched it with horses and a plow. And one of the cool things when we started restoring this, we found an old horseshoe in the field. So we still have that on our mantle right now. We picked it up and it sits on our mantle, a sort of a reminder of where we've been and where we're hopefully going. <clears throat> but what we ended up doing on this, we initially thought a WRP project, which is a wetland reserve program, which is administered through the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And it would have qualified for that, but our background in wildlife and wetlands, my wife was working as a wetland consultant, we decided to do a wetland mitigation bank on it. And so <clears throat> we went started going through that process, which is a long process, but wetland mitigation banking, what it is is when companies destroy wetlands, they have to replace their loss in a bank somewhere. So if they destroy an acre of wetland at that time, they had to replace 1.2 acres. So they would buy, you were a banker and you could sell them a credit and you still own the land. They just, that satisfied their regulatory requirement from the Army Corps of Engineers and DNR um, for their project to go forward. So that's what we ended up doing. This was, we ended up, constructing all the restoration, we broke all the tiles, filled all the ditches in. And this is, when I, it sounds easy, right? We actually had to hire an engineering firm um, to do that as required by the Army Corps engineers. But this is the following April after snow melt, after we did that. So it was a dry field with just water in the ditches to water spread out across this whole site. This is a cool part of this site too. This was all non-native reed canary grass and this was the summer of 2012 in August. And you guys remember 2012, right? The, the last big, big drought that we had. We talked to a local farmer to come in and cut this in August. And he sold it for like $75 a bale. It's just reed canary grass and crap that was all headed out. But that year, everybody was begging for hay. But so we cut it, got it off, let it green back up. We sprayed it twice to kill it and then put hydrology back on it 
and this is what it looked like the following spring with water. And you can see a lot of the, the dead reed canary grass in here, but then all the native vegetation that's coming. Um, Red-winged blackbirds on the site right there. Uh, we had a bunch of swans on there, a lot of cranes, waterfall of every species that you can imagine. <clears throat> that's looking, remember that picture of the corn when it was young, looking down, that's what it looks like today right now when you stand at that same exact spot. So this was permanently protected in a conservation easement. The County of Chippewa actually holds that easement on that. And this was the impetus, this project is the impetus to us buying our farm and then doing what we're doing now. But this is a aerial photograph of the after of, uh, of restoring it. You can see, this was just the spring after, but you can see all the hydrology returning um, to the site. And this is that back 40 I was talking about. And you can see this is all ditched and drained too, but we actually can't do anything with that because the owner that we bought it from put that in a permanent conservation easement prior to us buying it from him. Um, so we bought, it's a 40 that we really can't do anything with. It'd be nice to restore the hydrology, but we can't um, back there. <clears throat> all right, so this is now our farm by Cornell that we purchased in 2014. It's a 340 acre farm. It's kind of neat. Our neighbors had a little conservation wetland project that they did over here with some, they plugged all these ditches that were running here. And then ours is, starts here and runs all the way, all the way this way. But so this is a very busy county highway right here. It's County Trunk D. And you wouldn't think rural Cornell, rural Chippewa County would be very busy, but Highway 64 is right up here and Highway 29 is right down here. And it's a main thoroughfare for logging trucks that go down to Wisconsin Rapids. And when we started this, we're like, well, do we try to get animals over here somehow? And there's an S curve, like right he, right up here, there's S curve. And they come around that corner going about 65 miles an hour. And I'm like, just when we start crossing animals across that road is when a semi is going to come someday, even if we put signs up. And it was rocky and it was low and so we decided let's do a conservation project on it and we like wetlands let's let's see what we can do so we, we got a hold of our nrcs office and we got a hold of chippewa county and i should say like a lot of this stuff has to make sense financially too right and we're not afraid to use farm bill programs because that money's there for a reason and if we don't use it somebody else is going to use it and if we have land that qualifies and it makes sense financially we, we're on the impression that it's a, a pretty good thing to do but so you can see this main ditch running right here. And there's a ditch that ran through here, another ditch right here, three ditches right here. Um, it's just so common in this area that's like that. So we were able to get into a program called Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. And it's a permanent conservation easement. It's wetlands, prairie, and we can't graze that or hay that, but we're okay with that because of the rockiness of the soil, it being across the highway. Um, and we just really like having kind of set-aside areas on our farm that is for wildlife. This is a picture of Lauren. Uh, we hired Northland Excavating to do all of our excavating work. And this is a picture of him and his dozer filling in ditches. It took, I think this one took uh, two and a half days to do, and it's 47 acres. But this is the following spring then of when snowmelt happened, filling up the various wetlands. There's now nine wetland basins out in this thing. <coughs> And it was corn stubble that we dissed to get it ready to seed it um, to, to native vegetation. And this is the aerial photograph, remember the one before, right there. And this is what it looks like now with the different wetlands um, through there. And these look like ditches, but they're trails that we mow through it um, just to, for access um, and using them as uh, burn breaks when we introduce prescribed fire back onto the place. But you can see all these wetlands. This is the biggest one right in the middle. This was a picture of the uh, two springs after we restored those wetlands. So this was all dry. Now we have, I think we've had like 17 different species of waterfall using these wetlands just on this field um, since we've done it. Uh, a lot of Canada geese that we have using this. Um, you know, this is one little corner of the field that we left out because we had to leave a little three acre piece out. And this is my two oldest boys picking up deer antlers out there um, that shed. So it's, you know, it's a nice recreational area for our family. 
and friends that come out and hunt and, and just spend time outside. And these two boys think the world is the greatest thing when they get to find antlers like that laying out in the fields. And then this also makes me really happy too. Um, this is part of our lifestyle. We're hunters, very unapologetic about that. And it's, it's one of these things where we get a lot of wild protein off of our farms too, between waterfall, turkeys, deer, upland birds. Um, we just, we spend a lot of time outside. This is on that, that bigger wetland where the picture of the swans was. Um, all right, so moving on, now we keep going to the west on the, the rest of the farm, and we're going to start. You can see here, here's a ditch. Here's another ditch. This is a main ditch. Here's another ditch running through. You can see this right here. This is an old indication uh, on the aerial photograph of a wetland. There was another one here, and there's a ditch that drained this and drains this pond right here, and then it drains into a ditch that crosses the road and goes out. So we worked with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service out of Nasita to come out. They have a program called the Partners Program, where they basically do the design work on wetlands, and then you pay for all the, um, the restoration work. And a nice thing working with them is they, they don't get charged the permit fees for the DNR, which is $500 per wetland, and if you did it privately. So they'll come out, and they'll work with you on doing the permitting. Sometimes they'll pay for it, but we offered our own money as a match for some wetlands. So we actually put it, we plugged this ditch right here and, and did this and restored this wetland and this one using that. And um, this is the following summer we got, or it was like late fall, there's a little frost on the ground. It was dry that year and we finally got like two inches of rain and it started filling up. And this was the following spring. I know it's a really blurry picture, but this is a northern shoveler, um, which is pretty uncommon for agricultural areas in our part of the state. They're more common along Mississippi River and Green Bay and areas where more waterfall is. But we actually had a nesting pair um, that spring that settled in our farm, which we thought is pretty awesome. And this is the this is the other one up top. You can see some bare ground. This is this is uh, late summer too. This is when it's still trying to fill up. And after this upcoming or this snow melt that will hopefully happen in the next month this thing will be overflowing i have confidence in but we had a lot of waterfall usage the first year there was a lot of what's neat is there's a lot of annual weeds that grow up in here smart weeds that ducks really like so they they get in there a lot and then you can see there's cattle in the background we actually graze all these wetlands now um those two and then there's three other ones that we've restored that i didn't show um, that we run our cattle through, you know, rotational grazing, moving them once every day. So, you know, I know some people say keep them out of the water, but I don't. I keep, I let them in there. I just give them a break of grass, and if the wetland's in there, they can go in there. Um, you know, from a wildlife standpoint and a bird standpoint, you see it out west. Uh, I was in Argentina this last summer duck hunting, and down there, it's just nothing but grasslands. And potholes and wetlands everywhere and their cattle have access to those and they have more wildlife and bird life than I've ever seen in my life in in the United States so I still I still graze these it's very controlled of course they don't they can't they're not in there for 10 days at a time destroying everything so our next big project is this ditch and this main ditch we actually just signed in September a WRP project the wetland reserve program to the NRCS and that's actually gonna take into account these wetlands we already restored ourselves. So it's gonna be a 55 acre um, planting and wetland restoration. And it's gonna, the main pool is gonna run from like, like this through here. And then we're gonna have a water control structure on it, which means that we're able to let water out and flood it when we can, when we, like later in the year. And basically what you can do is mimic wet dry cycles to keep those wetlands productive. And then we're also hoping, keeping our fingers crossed, and it sounds really um, good that we'll be able to sign a CUA, which is a compatible use agreement, that we will still be able to graze this WRP on a limited basis, you know, working with the NRCS and DNR and stuff, putting together like a wildlife friendly grazing plan um, where we can run cattle through here, but do it in a way that's beneficial to birds and, uh, and other wildlife. So this is just showing um, 
this is basically the WRP here. And then this is showing, we buffered this with uh, native grasses and flowers, the stream. And then this is a, a native wildflower planting uh, on the field that we just broke this up before because we wanted it there. Um, and then we make hay on this right now. But our plan is to make enough hay on some smaller fields and then we are gonna, gonna hopefully rent a field or two from a neighbor after we do this um, and then just bring our hay in for our cattle. So I know I say I'm all grass, this is corn right here. We planted this to try to keep deer off of our outwintering areas because we have deer are like rats to me now. I used to love them, but I'm really starting to hate them. Um, but this is a flock of Canada geese last fall, and this is where this main pool of the WRP is going to be. So in hopefully two or three years, once we get through the process of WRP, this will all be water. And I just I took this picture one day from the farm because I thought, you know, those geese are telling us where the wetlands should be already. You know, they're out there grazing on grass because geese are grazers, but I just I saw that as a sign that, that really should be put back to wetland. And of course, we'll just we'll throw a few pictures in here. You know, milkweed and some British white cattle in the background. We try to get a lot of native plants. There's some thistle in here. I don't, a lot of people hate thistle, right? Have you ever walked through thistle once it's went to seed and watched how many finches are fluttering out of that when you're walking through it? You know, people spend a lot of money through a winter buying thistle seed to feed finches, and we just grow it on the farm. And we get rid of some of it if it gets too thick, um, but we just we let it be otherwise. And this is another reason we let thistles be when it's flower and you walk out through it and it's just it's full of bees and it's a good plant i thought this was a really cool caterpillar i found one day in our pasture so it's just, you know it's not only waterfall and deer and turkeys it's that you know it's trying to do things like this um for them this is a woodcock that was sitting on top this is the only good reason to leave barbed wire on a farm as far as i'm concerned <laughs> is to have the old posts for the birds to sit on um, we've basically got rid of all the barbed wire and replaced it with high tensile on our place. And if nothing else, guys, listen up. <laughs> this right here is a good enough reason to plant wildflowers. Now, it really makes my wife mad that she doesn't get flowers on Valentine's Day, and she complained about it again this year, and I said, look, it's not in season. And we get, I said, you, you get flowers on the counter when our wildflowers are blooming, and that's that's what you get. So take it or leave it. Uh -huh. <clears throat> this is a picture of our family. This is when our first was born uh, eight years ago. We we're doing a prescribed fire in one of our native plantings. Um, he was out there right with us, so we're hoping we raise them in it. <laughs> Well, let's just talk about fire for a quick second. Uh, Chris and I were just having a conversation about that and the role of fire on our landscapes is, you know, as, as we've went along in the last century, Smokey the Bear, right, is one of the worst things that ever came about for our country because we suppress wildfire. And this is a picture from your guys' neck of the woods. Anybody that's from, like, here out towards Webster, Danbury, Grantsburg area, the the pine barrens that are out there, the pine and oak barrens. This is actually a jack pine stump that was cut out there showing um, the fire intervals on that landscape. And you look, it was, and I can't remember, it was like 2017, right? That was, but it was 1876, then it was nine years, 12 years, 13 years, 11 years. So a lot of this landscape, especially when you get out into the sandier country, used to burn on a 10 to 15 year interval. And that's what kept this open. And that's what kept birds like sharp-tailed grouse on our landscape here that we're fighting so hard right now to keep. Um, so we're, we're implementing fire on our farms, you know, in our woodlots. And we've burnt our hay fields. Actually, you ever want to see a hay field come back, a cool season grasses, is burn that dormant in the spring and put all that potash on the ground and all that free fertilizer you get out of it, it just grows back like crazy and you get a ton more forage out of it. Um, you know, you just have to mow nice breaks around your fences and we've had really good luck with that. But I just, I always throw this picture and this is the afternoon after burning in our old house where I'm just sitting out um, talking on the phone, of course, because that's what young kids do, right? When you're holding your baby. Yeah. <laughs> but you can see that's uh, where we burn, so. And that's it. That's what I got. I always finish with that one right there. So I'll take some questions before we before we have him take over. 
if anybody has any. I got, how hard is it to get rid of your canary grass? It seems pretty easy. It, it all depends on your, on how you can return it to a hydric state, right? If you can't put enough water on it, a lot of times um, you have to spray it to get rid of it. But what we're finding now too on our farm, we quit spraying it where we graze because we can graze it out. And we can graze it out and get that wetland back to native vegetation to the point I even was able to, it was a really good deal for me. There was a couple from south of Eau Claire that were restoring a wetland. They had a lot of reed canary grass and they asked if they could borrow some cows for the summer. Um, so we took four cows down. It doesn't sound like a lot, but we took four cows every spring, dumped them out in their pasture. They rotationally grazed them for the summer, and I got them back each with a calf on their side, and they grazed out their reed canary grass for us. So, and I never had to go down there. They took care of them. When they had calves, they were down there checking the calf like eight times a day, and <laughs> they were even mixing up stuff like lavender oil and some other stuff and spraying their sides when they thought the flies were too bad on them, and, and, uh, which I thought was pretty interesting but for us it was free grass but for them they got a really nice high quality wetland vegetation community out of it Lynn. on those restored uh, wetland areas where the native plants are being recovered or reestablished what kind of forage do you feel your cattle are getting from grazing those areas and how do you manage it so on the native stuff and around our wetlands i'm just man i Disclaimer, I'm not grazing warm season grasses yet. Um, that's my next project to do. Um, but uh, on our wetland stuff, it's I'm just grazing it like normal and managing them cool seasons like that. And But I think once we get to warm seasons, what you have to do is graze them a lot lighter and perhaps once a year and leave a lot higher residual on that. You know, if you're grazing native warm season prairie, you might only take it down to 10 inches and get your cattle out or whatever animal you have in there and then let it rest for an entire year after that are but sedges coming back sedges yeah so the question is are sedges coming back and on our places the sedges never left but they were crowded out by reed canary and now it's a solid sedge and wetland community native wetland plant community So the question is, do we have to get any special permits for prescribed fire, and have we ever burnt the leftover hay in the field? The first one is, the, first, the answer to the first question is, it depends on where you're burning at. Um, some townships require you to get a permit, and then you have to start at a certain time of day to make sure it's safe with relative humidity and winds and all this other stuff. And then there's some townships where it's the Wild West, light it up. Um, but... In the spring, I moonlight for a consulting company where we do prescribed fire, and we always make sure we call dispatch before we start anything, just to give them a heads up that there's going to be a fire and there's going to be a big smoke column going up, so they don't. Uh... But undoubtedly, when that when we do that, we have cops and fire trucks show up all the time because somebody calls and they haven't communicated to their deputies and whatnot that that's happening, and so they show up. Um, the second one, I have not. But I don't think that would be a terrible idea, but I just wonder how hard it would be to get them started if it's, uh, you know, wet hay that's all compacted. Have you, have you done that? I would think it would smolder for a really long time. Anybody else? Nobody? Well, if anybody, my number's wrong in there. It's 6355. They have 6356. But if anybody ever wants to talk about wetlands or what you could do to have wetlands on your place, trust me, it's really cool to be able to be on your place and watch birds and swallows and everything else on top of your wetlands. Um, I'd be happy to talk and, and look at your place and, and, um, and help you out however I could. All right. <clears throat> 15 minutes. Got it, Otto. Thanks. All right. Uh, Steve Stanford here. Um, I farm in Zambroda, Minnesota, Good Hugh County. We do corn and beans. We run about 800 acres total. Uh, I remember as a kid kicking the cattle off the farm. So, um, But since the 1990s, I've been doing restoration ecology. Prairies, thousands and thousands of acres. Prairie, savannah, they're the same thing, basically. Uh, that's another story. But um, 
back in the 1990s, started working with Todd Churchill a little bit down in Cannon Falls, Minnesota, 10,000 Hills or 1,000 Hills Cattle Company, um, the Lorenz Brothers, meat processors down there. It's like, shouldn't prairies be grazed? And then I went back to school and got into it. And it's really basically, there's not a grassland, wet grassland, savanna situation that should not be grazed. And by not grazing them, we are losing the system. So I had a good talk just earlier that I've come to the point where invasive species, you've heard of those in plants before, right? Um, you show me an invasive species, I'll show you a nitrogen problem, but basically that nitrogen problem came because we took the grazing animals off the land. Could Buck you repeat that again, that statement you just made? <clears throat> The, the invasive plant species are literally, I can model them as being an outcome of taking the grazing animal off the land. And the model's so robust, it's like when I show it to other people and walk it through, it's like, oh yeah, makes total sense. The statement so, before that about oh, there shouldn't be any... There should breeding. be no grasslands that are not harvested <laughs> in some point. Otherwise, they won't be grasslands. So that's, that's how critical grazing is. Lynn wanted me to just go through all, all these, and I'd love to see any of your evaluations written down so we can increase this list right here. Um, ecological and social ecological benefits. I'm coming from the ecology and both. Being a UW-Madison guy, we got a lot of social down there. Carbon sequestration, soil building, nutrient regulation, wildlife habitats, like Ashley said, birds, smaller herbivores, salamanders, frogs, turtles, insects. Graze obligate vegetation, nutrient cycles, water purifications. These are some of the benefits that we get from grazing versus not grazing. You show me a period that's not grazed, I'm not interested in it anymore. Okay? These okay. are the ones we got to communicate right. to our yep. customers. Yep. And on your evaluation sheet, if I'm missing something on the ecology side here, put it down there because I want to build this list. Um, I, I keep wanting to write a couple books. One would be the catastrophic regime shift of our savanna ecosystems and really goes through a lot of what we're talking about. On the social ecological, uh, local healthy foods. Um, my grandfather was a, 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 a butcher. Uh, his brother was a butcher in the other town, Zimbroda, Pine Island. I come from that kind of family. Jobs, grazers, infrastructure, processors. So these are all the jobs associated with. Look at all these booths we have here. It's all jobs, um, fewer pesticides. Water quality, so that's the social ecological side of this thing right here. So here, here's one of the premises that I'm throwing out for you guys, because you guys are very experimental. The grazers are an extremely experimental group of people. One of my heroes in ecology, C.S. Holling, brought us resilience. So many other things. He passed away just a few years ago. On his epitaph, it's like, experiment wildly. We need more people doing different things to sit and thinking outside of the box. And as long as you've got some good assumptions, hmm, I wonder, I've been looking at this for a long time. Let's try this. We need more of that. Pro tragically, with our crop farming, we are basically on a sheet of paper and told us what to do every single year, and we just drive the tractor across the land. And then, <laughs> kind of crazy. These are all different types of grassland savannas in the world. They're all graze-dependent ecosystems, graze-obligate ecosystems. 35 million years. And so my premise is, what can we pull from this 35 million year period of evolution and refinement and refinement by the second law of thermodynamics, returns on investment? What can we pull from this to inform us going forward? And that's what kind of Ashley's poking around with that. That's what he's kind of doing on his place. The most critical aspect for maintaining savanna grassland ecosystems is biomass harvest. I try to go through everything. I'm like, okay, what's really critical? Fire. Pain and grazing. Of course, this wasn't part of that. <laughs> this is just a mimic. But some of the most diverse grasslands in the world are hay fields. They've been hay for hundreds of years over in Europe. The biodiversity is what kindergarten students know 52 different types of flowering plants in, in Sweden, Transylvania, Romania, where they still hay like this. Can you imagine that? Hay, as you guys know, I've seen a lot of hay bales in here today, is critical. We actually could hay some of his CRP and get the most wild diversity out there ever and then feed that to his cattle. So what we, we just spoke at Marble Seed, Tom over here. We did a four-hour university class. And so one of the things that we really talked about, can we brand that? Can we get that on the grass-fed label, what Ashley's doing? Just say, native fed, you know? And can we brand that? And, and you know, I'm not even saying certify it. I'm just saying branding it to start with. Uh, General Mills comes along, they want to pay me money to certify it. 35 million years, and basically we can see of all the terrestrial ecosystems, forest, tropical rainforest, coniferous forest, they're all so far behind and lacking in their ability to take sunlight energy in 
and transition it into animal tissue, plant tissue. Grassland savannas are the ultimate, the most recent, the most powerful. When I say powerful, I'm using that from a thermodynamic sense, okay? So anyways, it's the ultimate model. Of, it's Gaia's, you know, uh, best example of it. What's really interesting is we look at it from, let's go back into dinosaur time, the vegetation was not edible. And when the mammals came on Earth after the meteorite hit the planet, it took about 20 million years to, for it to come together. But the vegetation became highly, highly edible in the face of mammals, what's going on there? Returns on investment, you know? I'll become more edible, you can eat me, now we're cycling nutrients to the benefit of the water, of the soils. Isn't that interesting? And then all of a sudden like, oh, it makes sense. So it's kind of an interesting thing. Keystone species give lots of room for these, these you know. I mean, I can't, I think of my pastures, my CRP, we have 100 acres of CRP, the animals in them, they're gone. When we, had our, when we had our pastures there, there were so many animals running around out there. And we could play croquet in our pastures. I'm talking the 1970s, so I mean, everything was overgrazing there. Whoa. Yeah, that's the Arctic tundra. What's an Arctic tundra? It's a grassland, right? And those are the great, oh, some trees. It's a savanna, right? So the whole plant, Serengeti, you know, how can we mimic what, what this process was? So I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what it looked like. And that's hard. You know, I'm just like, I read these stories from this guy here, Osborne Russell, really good book to read. He was a, a, a journalist, Philadelphia Inquirer, and he lived in the mountains in the 1830s to like 1840, mountain man out in Idaho. We don't even know where he was. But just basically, some of these lines in here, bison everywhere. Grass is beautiful. Theodore Roosevelt National Park. You go to these places, you can learn things too about how it used to be. Um, it, the William Hornaday, I think 1889, um, you know, is studying the, the end of the bison at this time, all the different migration routes out here. So much we can learn. Um, trees. This is over in Europe. Six adult bulls escaped one winter. These are European bison. Six adult bulls for three months escaped into the forest, I put parentheses around that, and killed 3,000 trees in three months. Six bison, they stripped the bark off of. Ash trees. And the oaks are like, thank you very much, bison. You know? So, I mean, it's like how much, even to the point of what we call forest, I would say 90% of what we call forest and protect as a forest ecosystem probably wasn't forest at all. Kevin Mahalko's got some nice forest on his property, one of the rare events I've seen, but most of it is not. They were more savannas. Here, here's a floodplain forest right here in Theodore Roosevelt National Park with bison. Look how healthy that looks. Here's a, there's nothing here. This is down in the Minnesota River Valley in St. Paul. There's nothing here growing on the ground. There's nothing edible. It's bare soil. Thank goodness the beavers are working. Oh, they killed the beavers because yeah, the beavers are cutting trees. Oh. I know. It's like opening up. Look, that's the area where you can camp right there. You can camp right where the bison are walking through. Um, different structures like this. We talked about grazing lawns. This is a classic thing. A lot of old pastures when I was a kid in the spring of the year before the people put their cattle back out on it because it was too wet. Um, they knew that those cattle would go in and graze that grass down in the spring of the year. That's where the ephemerals were. Pastures full of ephemerals. And when the, these guys senesced and went away underground again, that's where we put the cattle. We really believe the writings in, in, um, over in Africa, it's like, oh no, those are grazed obligate. The grazers come at one turn. And that's what we see in native grazing. They come in in the summertime into the shade, hang out, and then they disappear again. Okay, and that's these flower communities are completely designed based on those grazing periods. Hey, as you went through this right here, no duck's going to get in and out of that pond, no turtle, no salamander, no frog, all those cattails, but here comes the grazer, and boom, now we can get in and out. I mean, and the diversity goes up. Um, so yeah, like just like Ashley was saying, it's like we need this for those ducks and salamanders and turtles to go in and out of these systems like that. Even where I live right now in Duluth, the southwest facing knolls, you can still see the old dying yellow birch. Giants, they're all dead, open, growing, and I'm sure when they're caribou and elk and the deer population, etc., up in that area, those were open grazing lawns or balls as they call them. And in spring air, we like that. So I'll just fly through some of those grazing lawns. A lot of the vegetation, then any vegetation we see in the grasslands are basically graze obligate. So any prairie plant, any savanna plant is graze obligate. Without it, it'll disappear. Federally threatened, it doesn't, you know, I mean, kittentails, but these are all plants that, these are my lawn. 
I mow my lawn to min and I harvest the grass out of the bag catcher and, and I put it in my garden to grow good tomatoes. These are all my lawn right here. And I'm just mimicking grazing. I'm mimicking grazing lawn in my lawn. I have 70 some species of plants in my, more, more so than any of our CRP fields. So I'm just mimicking grazing. Trails, fantastic. North Dakota aerials, isn't that cool? Those are all trails going in and doing wetlands, allowing the turtles to get out of there, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I love these things. I'd love to see some of these more in, in for, for wildlife benefits. Big old snapper turtle there, frogs, salamanders, et cetera. Even as Ashley was saying, this is a point of denitrification, greases surface area, huge benefit. The wallows, the dung piles, whole food webs come on. I noticed this is a bison pad, mule deer poop right there. I mean, and just the things that, this is Kevin Mahalko's farm right here. Big old dung beetle, roll beetle up there. And um, yeah, I mean, just think of the birds eating off that. And then, you know, that bird right there, the crew is standing on a cow pie. Now, there's cow pie after that metal arc out there. And that's what they're looking. And even some of the insects eating that dung are then eaten by a mouse, eaten by a fox. Whole food webs come off those dung piles. Think of the nutrients going through that. Of course, we know the birds. Laura Payne worked with you guys a long time ago. She did a lot of really nice work. Some birds like intense grazing. Some birds like very little grazing. I kind of lined them up on the spectrum up here. So a little bit of everything. Is, and that's kind of like, well, that, duh. When we remove the herbivores from the landscape, so here's the plants, here's the herbivores, there's the carnivores, trophic level. Let's take the herbivores out. Uh, beautiful nutrient cycles going through there. We get a whole collapse, the carnivores collapse, the nitrogen just recycles around, keeps building up from the atmosphere. Pretty soon the trees start going really fast, weedy, nitrogen-loving trees. In a little bit, no more grasses, no more flowers, just weedy, weedy trees. It's so inedible that we can't even graze anymore. We've gone through a complete catastrophic regime shift. Notice back when they were grazing, the carbon's going into the cycle, the nitrogen's going into the atmosphere. 80% of my lungs is filled with nitrogen right now. Let's take those herbs. Boom. There it comes. Wow. There goes the grass. Look at the root systems. Okay. Carbon's now going out of the atmosphere. Nitrogen's going in. We're enriching this system to the benefit of these weedy trees. So anyways, that's kind of, and even up in northern Minnesota, I really wonder how much of that area looked like when we had the moose and everything else up there. That's Isle Royal, 800 moose and 30 wolves. And this year, look at that. You go, to, you go to Ely, Minnesota now where the moose have been eliminated, you can't walk through the woods. How could a moose get through that? So again, herbivores begin herbivores. You take the herbivores out, wow, can't even deer hunt up there anymore. So we call that catastrophic regime shift. So I'm going to skip ahead. Oh, this is in Bloomington. I just want to show you this picture. Let's leave it here and then I'll skip ahead and I'll just show you quickly how we might do some of this stuff. Um, this is a short grass prairie right here, short grass savanna. Seven years ago, we put, took the herbivores out of there again, okay? First time we did it, we, we killed all the herbivores and starved the people to the reservations, and they took their fire with them. Bam. Settlers came in, set up their fences, boom, and then we kicked them out. It's a national wildlife refuge right now. There's not enough food in this system to feed a deer mouse because we took the animals out, and we also took the people out at the same time. So that's kind of a really interesting thing. Me, as a big ecologist... When stuff like that happens to me, it just, I was like, wow. A lot of these plants that do come in, the high nitrogen, we go Two through minutes. that. Two minutes, got it, okay. So this is where I wanted to go. This is kind of what we're looking at right now. We're looking at literally grants. We got some people from Marble Seed that have come up and say, I want to try some of this stuff, man. Um, NRC grants, there's the Sarah Grant type situation, Native Fed, and that's what we would stamp Ashley's cattle products on type of situation. It would be branding. Um, it'd be, you know, in addition to the organic or grass fed, and we're looking at 10%, maybe it's 20% of your product is native fed. Um, and it can include hay. I'm trying to make this easy for us farmers out here. It could be public and private lands, 10% coming from native fed. It comes from the Isle Prairie strips. But we're going to work it one minute. Can you sell that to Wisconsin DNR? Because they're the ones that got a lot of land. And, and I just called up, what's her name, the other day. Mary and, C. Yep, and Mary's going to get back to me. She called me back up and said, let's talk. And we're, So, yep, I think Wisconsin people from Marble Seed that say, hey, I've got this. And they're Wisconsin people, too. So I think we can get this going. Thank so you. So we're going to work this land. So just having the flowers here, let's work it to keep the flowers there. And it can be hanging. That's a that's a 80-acre site I hate for prairie. 
and the, the quality of the flowers that increase in those hate areas and the nitrogen is going down about 100 pounds per acre per year type situation. So in Minnesota alone, 1.3 million acres in wildlife management area, most of these sites need to be grazed again. They've really gone backwards, okay? Uh, we need a new set of metrics. We're measuring right now the quality of sites by flowers. What about insects? What about birds? I mean, it's just like flower-centric. I just wrote our DNR. Um, and I'll just, I'll just go through quick, like, some of the stuff. It's limited by how much nitrogen is on the ground and too much shade. Um, too much nitrogen, old barnyard. These areas here, as Ashley knows, are more difficult to restore. I'll come up to um, Haynes, a great way to do that. Ashley, this is a fire I did myself just on our farm uh, 20 acres a couple years ago. My first night fire was a solo fire. Burning, we could do a whole thing on the benefits of your pasturing if we can burn them like Ashley was just getting to. Um, more and more Audubon for birds. Ashley and I talked about this right now. Audubon, the big bird people are grazing more and more. And the program is called like uh, Burgers for Birds. And as you said, tell me it's coming to Wisconsin. That's Florida, where they're literally putting the cattle into the marshlands to graze it out for bird habitat again. Um, too much shade is a big problem. This is an oak savanna, one of the most productive. Your cattle got shade, you've got grasses, it is a grassland. And we do this work. I'll just show you this work and then, then I'll be done. But um, this is one, this is six months. That's six months after we did that work in the winter time. We use some big machines, feller bunchers. Again, we can help maybe pay for a lot of this work and get it back in production. The red slashes here are trees I would have still taken out. We, we find that about 90% reduction of the trees is about where we get back to. We literally have to shock the system back. We can't go back to the edge of the cliff because we'll get blown off really quickly. Like, uh, these are some of the machines that we use right here, that poor golden retriever. Um, that's the cutting head on that, 90, 90, 90 inch wheel, skidding it out. And in six months, we're ready to fire we can put fire on that, and we can start grazing it. And the long, these are city parks. You know, it's a 200-acre park. In the long term, it's like if you're going to hold it in that grassland system, you got to graze it or burn it all the time. But let's graze it. And now some of the city parks in Minneapolis are saying, yeah, we really do need to get into that. But I won't go through this. My farm, you know, here's on your farm. Maybe we find just like what Lynn was saying and what Ashley was saying, it's those areas that aren't very productive anywhere. Anyways, that's where I can grow my best prairie. I can have past flowers and, you know, boom, boom, boom. So the rest of it's doing exactly the way you're grazing it, but we identify where those areas are. And then put a little wire up around it. Don't graze it until we give you the plans, get it established. Here's a long ridge. It's just, oh, it's rocky and, oh, you know, here's, we can do the savanna work too. It did, I don't have trees in it, but, um, I mean, I do here, but the point is, savannas and grass sense, we can do all this work in like that. And then here's your regular pasturing. And here's your prairie pasture, and here's your prairie hay field. Ten percent. We brand that for you. And I think it'll really work well. Um, fiber brands in the back. I've always wanted to run fiber sheds in the back, and it would be just another thing. But I'm not going to go through how this is done, basically, um, because we're out of time. But, um, yeah, this is kind of the how-to. Maybe we do that next fall, then. We go yeah. into how if we could actually do this. people want you this. back, you can show yep. us how to do it. This is uh, actually a grassland that I do develop for all native grasses that we've actually come up with for um, some grazing people. These are these are three, four species of bluegrass that are native that we don't have seed production. These are native bluegrass. We can have them in our lawns and our pastures. These are all native species we do not have in seed production yet. You, we can start seed production. Anyways. Drilling, and I think that's probably about my timeline. We'll get into fire next time, too, next fall. The role of fire, just like Ashley was saying. Some Angus walking at the fire. Why we burn. Very critical to have that fire on the landscape. You have enough for another hour. Right? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> so anyways, um, I, I think the take-home message is this. Um, you know, we, 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 we're doing really good at what we're doing. What you're doing is beautiful for the landscape, the water quality, the soil, the wildlife, like that. Can we do even more? Even if we started experimenting with 10% of the land, can that be a fundable program that we get that going with? So with that, the lights are on. Thank yeah, thanks a lot.